Hello, and welcome back to my reviews of Doctor Who. And hey, hi, geez, it's been so long since I've talked to you guys, I was working on that, you know, that video for so long. And on that note, I have a few things to say about that, uh, and I'll be quick. Thing one, thank you so much for watching it, commenting on it, liking it, pushing it out there. Uh, it has blown the first video essay out of the water. It's at 21,000 views as of right now, and it's only climbing. Which, of course, overjoys me to see the positive reception. It's amazing. Uh, I'm so grateful to all of you that have left, you know, really heartfelt comments on how the video has touched you. And if you have left one of those comments and I have not responded to it yet, I'm getting to them. There are so many of them, and I want to give each comment you know, the attention it deserves. And on that note, I guess I can just say right here, if you are one of those people, thank you so much again. If I have responded to your comment, I'm thanking you again. And if I have not yet, I'm thanking you right here. Oh, and of course, a thank you to everyone who has watched it, whether you agreed with me or disagreed with me. Thing two. Please stop commenting about how the Matrix Doctor isn't real. Yes, I confess, I made a mistake on the internet, I'm sorry. And honestly, who can blame me? It was in like one throwaway line from the Master in The Timeless Children. I digress, it's my fault, I should have done more research on that part specifically. But hey. Ask yourself this. Does it really matter? You know, we still got that big open space of just nothing in the lore in between the Timeless Doctors and the First Doctor. Does it really matter that I got that one thing wrong? It's still a mystery. It doesn't change the video. Uh, and thing three, and this is the smallest thing out of them all, I'm just gonna be very, very brief here, because it's a very, very small sector of people that feel this way. It pertains globally across chapter nine, but in specific to, uh, the Doctor chapter. Uh, and for those people that did miss this from the intro to chapter nine, I don't know how you could, I spent so long talking about it, but I'm just gonna reiterate again, I'm not biased toward the 13th Doctor in any way, you know, beyond what I've seen of the show and what I dislike about the 13th Doctor from the show. I am not biased in any way toward Jodie Whittaker or her gender. I think it's important to my integrity as a content creator to distinguish myself from the people that are biased to the Chibnall era because the Doctor is a female and me, someone who genuinely dislikes the Chibnall era because I don't think Chris Chibnall is a very good very good writer in regards to his Doctor Who work. I can't speak for Broadchurch. But yeah, all that nonsense aside, we're here for Eve of the Daleks, the most recent Doctor Who episode, the first of the Jodie Whittaker specials, one of three. The next one is called Legend of the Sea Devils, and the third one, we don't know the name yet. So yeah, this is the first of the three episodes in the Jodie Whittaker specials leading up to Jodie Whittaker, the 13th Doctor's regeneration in the last episode. And this episode, following in the trend of Chibnall's previous New Year's specials, is a Dalek story, titled Eve of the Daleks, following after a Resolution in 2019, Revolution of the Daleks in 2021, and of course, Eve of the Daleks, which premiered two days ago. Oh man, I'm excited. So I will be, of course, as I always do, going through every single scene in the episode, talking about it, what I liked, what I didn't like, to create a comprehensive depiction of the episode for you guys watching at home. Uh, with this episode, there's a little bit going on in terms of setting up of bigger things throughout the Jodie Whittaker specials and tying up stuff from Flux. Very minimal of that, but there is some of it. Uh, and it's also got a really cool gimmicky, uh, you know, Moffat-esque plot going on with this whole time loop Groundhog Day thing. Uh, throughout the episode, and it's very integral to the episode, so I'm introducing a new little thing on the screen to make the review make a little bit more sense for you guys as, as I go through every single scene, talking about what I liked and didn't like. So uh, down here, same with all the other reviews, I have a label of the scene that I'm talking about. As I go from scene to scene in the review, that will change, so you kind of have a map of what exactly I'm talking about at any given point in time, and you have a map of where exactly sections begin and end in terms of like scene by scene stuff. And a new addition with this episode, in the top left corner, I'll be having a marker of what rotation of the time loop we're in. So in this episode, as you probably already know, there's like a time loop Groundhog Day thing going on, I've already talked about it. And there are, how many rotations are there? There are, I think, eight, nine rota- there are nine rotations total, counting down towards uh, New Year's Day, that's the whole gimmick of the episode. So... Starting from the first rotation, this will say first rotation, and then second, third, fourth, fifth, whatever, as we count down to the ninth one, the final one, where the episode resolves itself. Uh, since we have similar scenes playing over and over again in this episode, hopefully this edition will make it a lot easier to follow in the review. Oh, also, God, I'm so upset. 
Uh, I was assuming that this episode was not going to be premiering on AMC+, Plus, uh, the online streaming service that I use to get the reactions for the Doctor Who Flux episodes. I was assuming that that was limited to the six episodes in Doctor Who Flux. But lo and behold, I do some investigating and... After some very light digging, I see Eve of the Daleks on the front page of AMC+, Plus, ready to watch online. So I'm assuming with the following Jodie Whittaker specials, I will be able to catch these on AMC+, Plus and do the reviews and the reactions. But for this one, I did not get a reaction for it. I apologize. I think those make it a lot easier to follow the review and give context to the stuff that I'm talking about. I'm so sorry I couldn't make it happen for this one. I'm going to try to be a bit more detailed in the way I'm explaining things. If not, I apologize. But yeah, that is way more than enough preamble. Let's get into the episode now. Eve of the Daleks. Oh, also, I forgot to say that uh, my general thoughts for this episode, uh, it was not as good as I wanted it to be, but it was not a complete train wreck. I think in terms of like a ratio of proportionately good and bad things pinned up against the rest of the Chibnall episodes, I think this is on the better end of episodes in terms of like good and bad things and what outweighs them. But in terms of Doctor Who at large, I still think it's pretty much like a mixed bag. We'll, we'll get into it. So the first scene of Eve of the Daleks is a bunch of establishing shots of elf storage. This is the location for the episode. It's this big warehouse with multiple stories of people coming in and renting, you know, storage space, and we're about to meet some new characters who are involved in the goings-on of this facility. We have some more establishing shots of the interior of this place, just some, you know, moving cameras over some New Year's music, I guess, and then we uh, pull out to the exterior and we see a car pulling up, and this is a new character that we're about to meet, and then we go inside and we meet another new character. So these are two, two, two new characters that we're about to meet, and these are the supporting cast of the episode. We first meet Sarah, who is on the phone when we see her. She's in the kind of lobby of Elf Storage on the phone to a guy named Jeff, and she's giving some exposition about uh, who she is, what the goings-on of Elf Storage are, and the context around the characters and what they're about to say in this scene so that we as audience members care about what they're about to say. Still, in terms of exposition, I think this is pretty forced. It's a nitpick to be sure, but I think it's very silly to have this new character that we don't know anything about, and Chibnall's way of introducing character traits of her, and, you know, the plot points around elf storage. You know, to just establish all of that over the phone to some guy that we never see. You know, she says stuff like, it's New Year's Eve, I own elf storage, and you are employed to me, Jeff, and you always never come into work on New Year's Eve, and you always disappoint me and I hate you and stuff like that. You know, looking at ways to introduce a character and their relationships in their lives, I think over the phone is a way that it's frequently done and it can be done well, but I think with just like paragraphs upon paragraphs of like run-on sentences, establishing things about Sarah and Jeff's connection, as well as how elf storage works and the history surrounding the events that the characters are taking place in, there are far more natural ways to do it. Still, it's a nitpick, and I guess I'll make up for that by saying that the character that is introduced in this scene, Sarah, I think is very, very good in the episode. I'll get into more of that later, but I think in terms of good things about this episode, Sarah is one of the biggest good things about it. She is a very fun character. She's characterized mostly consistently. She has some great lines, some funny moments, and she's pretty integral to the episode at large in terms of like being an important character and how it gets resolved. So yeah, Sarah's great, and she's talking over the phone in this scene, and we get a cutaway of a shoulder at the front door of Elf Storage, and it's kind of on this left side of the frame. I'm doing a poor job of explaining the shot, but I'll, I'll put up a picture of it. It's just a shot with this, and then there's a shoulder on the left-hand side. This is Nick, okay? Second new character, it's Nick. And we know that Sarah and Nick are connected. In this scene, we're about to establish that they are connected, and the audience is going to learn about the implications around the way these two characters are connected and how that is going to progress through the story so that the characters develop through the story and we feel like we have an enriching connection between these two characters. He introduces himself awkwardly so we know that this guy is going to be characterized as someone who's a bit more introverted and shy and nerdy, a bit awkward with girls, whatever. The dialogue between Nick and Sarah continues where Nick says, here we are again. So at this point the audience knows that, okay, these characters know each other and it goes way back, and Sarah is not very happy with that because she appears very discontent at him being here, and she says, yep, here we are again. 
She makes her way around to the front desk and helps Nick with the logistics of getting into his unit. Nick, for some reason, asks what the rules and regulations of the units are, what he can and can't store. Sarah goes through the list articulately, but he just pulls out Monopoly, and I guess it's kind of like a funny thing where, oh, he was just being silly. He has Monopoly, and then he goes to his unit. But after watching it, it's very clear to see that this is a setup toward the resolution of the episode. I won't talk about exactly how it gets resolved, but it is in relation to an individual storing something that they should not store. So it's a very weird exchange. I don't think it's particularly bad in terms of, like, the characterization. In fact, I'd say the characterization is quite good. I think Sarah is very well characterized as someone who is very capable and, you know, comfortable in social situations. He's very comfortable being, you know, at least on a micro scale, kind of rude, and makes it apparent, if only a little bit, that someone's getting on her nerves. And I think Nick is characterized very well as someone who is a bit introverted and shy and whatever. I think his lines are appropriately awkward. I suppose it's just in the things that the episode is trying to set up later on that are attached to this conversation that makes it a little bit weird that she just goes down the list of everything and then pulls out Monopoly. I don't think that particularly works. But in regards to setting something else up, I don't really think it's a plot point that needed like a tie-in set up as to, oh yeah, this is something that, you know, you can't store. So we set it up at the beginning. There's no real need for that because anyone with common sense would know, yeah, you're not allowed to store gunpowder and explosives and whatever in a storage unit. So I think it might be another instance of Chibnall overriding his scenes and setting up things that don't need to be set up and just confusing the characterization dialogue. Yeah, I guess that's my problem with it. It's fine. It's, it's fine enough, I think. It's just a little bit weird that that is set up when it doesn't feel like it needs to be. So Nick walks off and then we cut away to the Doctor and the TARDIS with Dan and Yaz. Uh, where she is resetting the TARDIS, plugging a bunch of cables into whatever, uh, to purge all of the Flux, you know, corruption. This is the one thing about Doctor Who Flux that is tied up in this episode. You know, all of the other crazy stuff about Flux, who the Grand Serpent is, stuff around the implications of the Fob Watch, you know, the universe being destroyed by the Flux and almost everyone being dead. You know, all of that, that doesn't need to be explained. I disagree. <laughs> But, you know, it could be worse. So the Doctor is plugging in cables to the uh, jagged pillars around the console, saying that uh, the TARDIS is going to need to be reset and that they have to get out or they'll be killed. So they're going to land on the beaches of, like, an alien planet and live on a resort for a little bit. The Doctor throws the lever and then they all book it out of the TARDIS to find themselves in elf storage, where Yaz says, Where's the beach? The characters very quickly realize that this is not the beach and the Doctor scans her surroundings and, you know, picks up on the fact that this is elf storage and that there are energy readings above them, not linked to the TARDIS, of course. And then the TARDIS gets the, uh, you know, the etchings on it from the uh, promotional stuff, which is a really cool image, and I gotta give props to Chris Chibnall for that. It looks fantastic with those etches on it. Dan asks the Doctor if the etchings are normal, to which the Doctor replies, I have no idea. And then the Doctor, with a huge grin on her face, decides to dash off into elf storage with the companions to solve the conflict of the episode. I have to say, right out the gates, I was so optimistic with this episode in terms of the Doctor and her writing and her role in the episode after seeing this intro. I think Chris handled that grinning optimism in the Doctor very well. I think the way she just kind of jumped in and felt very casual in the way that she was scanning her surroundings and then ultimately deciding that she wants to engage in the conflict, I found it to be really, really promising. We then cut away back to Nick, who is in his storage unit, putting post-it notes on uh, the Monopoly game, a tiny bit of allusion to the implications around, you know, his storage unit, and we'll find out more about that later, but uh, he's in his storage unit, and then all of a sudden the lights go red, you know, emergency lighting or whatever, and he walks out, he calls for Sarah, and then from behind, out of nowhere, a Dalek appears, who asks Nick to identify himself, and he says, I'm Nick. So delightfully abrupt, I thought it was a fucking hilarious moment. I loved that to bits. We cut back to Sarah in the lobby, who's getting a phone call from her mother, and we get some nice, you know, characterization lines between uh, Sarah and her mother, and it's also kind of a plot point of this episode. Given that this is like a whole Groundhog Day situation, we're going to be seeing this phone call from Sarah's mother a lot in the episode, so this is the first time that we're getting it, and it's a rather nice way to set up the fact that we're going to be getting this exact same dialogue a lot throughout the episode, and we got to get used to it. Sarah's mother is appropriately very droning in the way that she talks to her daughter. Uh, Sarah is very sarcastic and comfortable in the way that she answers her mother's questions. It's a nice exchange that characterizes both of them very well. 
Of course, more often than not, the problem with Chibnall's stories is that the characterization starts very promising, and then once the plot develops, the characters just kind of squeeze into the same, you know, typical one-line responses in order to keep the plot moving, uh, which betrays the consistency of the characters. So, in the progression of this episode, that was the number one thing that I needed to see. I needed to see that this characterization remained consistent and that Sarah remained this mouthy and abrasive character. All of a sudden, stuff starts happening very quickly. Uh, right after this, the Doctor and company encounter Nick's body, like, almost immediately, and the Doctor recognizes that it's a Dalek, you know, bullet wound or whatever. And then we almost immediately cut back to Sarah in the lobby, where the Dalek enters saying that this area is under Dalek supervision, and then it kills Sarah. The Doctor, Dan, and Yaz then enter, to which the Doctor has this kind of standoff with the Dalek. Uh, she antagonizes the Dalek, saying, why are you killing these people? Very dumb question. Daleks kill people all the time. For some reason throughout this very short scene, the Doctor is brandishing her sonic screwdriver in the direction of the Dalek and, you know, threatening to jam his weapon systems or whatever. And this is something that I didn't really get the opportunity to talk about in my actual reviews of Chibnall and the Remastered Video Essay. The fact that so frequently the sonic screwdriver's purpose and function are changed on a dime to fit the situation that the episode finds itself in. You know, people criticize the way Stephen Moffat wrote the Sonic Screwdriver as being like a magic wand kind of thing, but that's not even on the same level as how Chris Chibnall writes it. But yeah, the dialogue in this scene continues. The Dalek says that it learns from, you know, how the Doctor used it to jam the Dalek's gun stick and resolution, and then it uh, kills Jodie Whittaker, who regenerates into the 14th Doctor. Nah, for real. The Dalek kills the Doctor and her companions, and then we get the title card. So at this point, as you've probably already gathered, these people are not dead. This is all a product of the time loop, and after the title card passes, uh, we're cut back right into the scene with Nick and Sarah, where we first met them at the beginning, but instead of Sarah being on the phone and walking around and then Nick comes from behind, they're already talking to each other across the countertop, where uh, Sarah gives Nick his keys to his unit, and then he goes off. We have some nice Dutch angles to simulate discomfort and disorientation, and we get a really short scene where Nick and Sarah go through the motions of their last conversation, but at this point having had the conversation already, so it feels a little familiar to them. The characters seem to understand that they are in a time loop and that this has happened again, but neither of them say it, which is huge, and I'll get into the reason why in a second. It's really spectacular that in approaching the dialogue in this scene, Chibnall has opted to kind of employ more tactics of show-don't-tell, which he has not done a lot throughout his run. So to get a scene like this pretty early on in the episode where there is some very, very subtle and some very, very big plot things going on in terms of like this complex time loop thing and Groundhog Day. I keep quoting Groundhog Day, but that's just my frame of reference. Going on and the characters don't immediately just ask dozens of questions that the audience may or may not have. In this scene, Chris is being respectful to the characters and the characterization that he has established. He has established the fact that Sarah and Nick are not particularly friendly with each other, not as far as, like, you know, mentioning things that are weird to each other. They would not in a million years bring this up with one another. So for them to not do that right here was huge for me. I, like, had to sit up for that. That was insane. I was not expecting that. I was expecting, you know, a dozen questions of the characters being, Wait a minute. Didn't we just say all this? Are we stuck in a time loop? Neither of them said that, and it's fantastic for it. So yeah, we have this exchange again. Nick goes off to his unit. We're repeating the same lines over and over, but with self-awareness this time. And then we cut away back to the Doctor, Dan, and Yaz, fleeing the TARDIS. And of course, in the scene right after I praise them on their subtle characterization, Yaz does literally exactly what I said the characters shouldn't do. Didn't we just get exterminated? And I'm aware that Yaz is more comfortable with Dan and the Doctor, which is why she's more openly like, hang on, something weird's going on, but I think it's still a pretty forced way of Chibnall trying to establish that the characters are confused. M maybe I'm being too difficult, but I think it's just really weird. I'm just not a fan of, like, self-insert lines where the companions are saying things that the audience may or may not be asking. So when I, as an audience member, have already caught up to the mysteries, it feels as though the episode is being a bit too slow or focusing a bit too much on dialogue that's mostly only used for 
mystery and setting up the fact that our characters are aware of a mystery as opposed to being a characterization line. Still, it's just the one line. She says, wait, didn't we get exterminated? Uh, and then we get a great big scene where Nick and Sarah kind of remember the fact that they died. Nick goes down the hallway where his unit is, where he got shot uh, in the first rotation, and he has a big, you know, flashback to the Dalek saying exterminate and then killing him, and then he kind of has, like, a mental breakdown, drops his stuff, and decides to book it in the other direction to look for Sarah. And Sarah has a similar moment where she's recollecting about dying, tries to leave through the front door, where we discover there's kind of like a Dalek force field on it, and then she decides in a big, you know, moment of clarity that she needs a weapon, and then she says Jeff's name, so she's going to Jeff's units to find a weapon. So that's what Sarah's doing. We cut back to the Doctor, Dan, and Yaz, who are back at Nick's uh, death site in the first rotation to find that he is not there because he has booked it in the opposite direction, like I said before. And I'm pretty sure it's just that. They go like, he's not here. Boom, boom, boom. And then we cut back to Nick, who is now at the front. And uh, he goes to the front desk to look at the cameras to see Sarah on the cameras. Uh, but he doesn't live long because then the Dalek comes in and kills him. And then we cut back to Sarah, and I'm just going to quote my note here because this was a scene that I was not a fan of. If you are a fan of this whole scene, I apologize, but Sarah goes to Jeff's room for some reason to look for a weapon. The audience has a laugh about how weird Jeff's stuff is. Very not funny, at least in my opinion. It's really strange to me how this Jeff character that we never see in the episode is so fucking integral to the advancement of the plot in this episode. He is almost completely culpable for the resolution of the story. Like, I don't get how there's even a viewpoint for how a, something like this is good. Like, who's gonna be like, oh, I love the part when Jeff, the character that I never met, resolved the story by having explosives in his unit. Like, what? It's so unsatisfactory. I think a scene like this, you know, it's, I, I'm, I value how much this episode is not taking itself super seriously and allowing itself to have fun and be kind of whimsical and a little bit off the wall silly. I guess it's just at this point in the story I'm wanting answers and I'm getting a funny moment where Sarah goes through Jeff's units and laughs at his canned goods. Awesome. And it's throughout this scene where Sarah is going through Jeff's stuff that her mom calls for the second time. So she picks up in a big tizzy, uh, yells at her mom for it not being a very good time. We go through the same dialogue of her wanting Sarah to meet a man, and then Sarah exits Jeff's unit into the hallway to find the Dalek, who is just kind of staring her down. Sarah hangs up the phone, and then we get a nice scene where Sarah tries to antagonize the Dalek, telling it to get off the premises or whatever. Ineffectively, of course. And we get a really nice line from the Dalek, where it doesn't respond with anything other than Increased fear levels detected. I mean, well, obviously. And then after a few more lines, Sarah dies. The Doctor, Dan, and Yaz encounter Nick's body for the second time in the lobby, and then the Dalek comes from behind again for the second time, and we get a second encounter of the Doctor versus the Dalek. Of the Doctor-Dalek encounters, this is one of the more timid ones. It's very short, where the Doctor asks questions at the Dalek about what the hell's going on, only for it to respond with stuff like, I'm completing my mission, and then it kills them, so... Great scene. <laughs> So stuff is speeding up at this point. Uh, we're going through the rotations a bit more quickly, as opposed to the first encounter, which is all set up. Uh, and this is the third rotation at this point. The Dalek has killed everyone twice, and this is the third one. Uh, we see Sarah immediately back. Uh, Nick is not here this time. It's just Sarah behind the desk. So again, the time loop is shortening. The Doctor is about to explain this. But the time loop is shortening. Uh, Sarah starts alone at the desk. She sees the Dalek on the cameras and decides she wants to go attack it. So that's how we get our Sarah set up. She goes and runs off to go attack the Dalek. The Doctor and company run out of the TARDIS again, where Dan references Groundhog Day, which I really liked. Time, time. Groundhog Day. Same difference. It's just so unapologetically self-aware about the fact that this is like a gimmicky idea that's been done to death, and how Dan, you know, a modern guy, just catches on immediately to what the hell is going on. I think it was fantastic. Um, we get a couple scenes of people running around in a big tizzy. We see Sarah running in a hallway, Nick running down a hallway, the Doctor and the companions running around. Uh, we get a lot of cuts of them all together, quick cuts, running, 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 and then Sarah and Nick bump into each other. So Nick and Sarah have a discussion about dying in this scene, and I think it's definitely functional in terms of characters acknowledging the fact that something weird is going on and expressing themselves around those weird circumstances. Still, I think it's a bit too much of establishing the fact that 
we are characters and we have been killed twice. Isn't that so crazy? As opposed to a character coping with the fact that they have been killed twice by a Dalek and how that makes them feel. It's a bit too... I, I suppose maybe the comedy is what's not working for me, but I think it's fine enough, and Sarah gets nice expressive moments in the scene, whereas Nick is more of kind of a foil to Sarah. He's just kind of the, the timid one that Sarah can then bounce off of and shine more, which is an interesting dynamic, and I do appreciate it. To a degree, I would like Nick to be a bit more expressive, but, you know, Sarah being better is nice too, I guess. And then, out of nowhere, the Doctor, Dan, and Yaz show up. They run up to Sarah and Nick. Jodie Whittaker pulls out her psychic paper and flashes it at them, and then we have a nice dialogue scene where Jodie talks to Sarah and Nick about who the Daleks are, what they want, and we get some expressive dialogue from Sarah and Nick about how they feel about the circumstances of this whole time loop thing. Also, if my voice sounds different, it's because I just woke up. It is taking me three days to record this. It's mostly a dialogue scene that exists to inform the characters about the stuff that the audience more or less already knows about, but it does have some nice characterization for Sarah in specific in the way that she confronts the Doctor about maybe being responsible for this whole Dalek attack. I think Sarah, despite being exclusively, like, a comedy character, uh, has some real emotional depth to a lot of her lines, and I do appreciate that. With Nick, I'm not feeling as much of that, which is why I feel like Sarah is, like, the MVP in terms of characters in the story, and Nick is just kind of the foil to make her look better and have funnier moments. Nick's dialogue in this scene is just a joke about the psychic paper. He doesn't get any sort of characterization lines about how he feels about dying in this whole thing. It's just kind of he rolls with it. I would expect a timid, awkward guy to be a little bit more afraid in a situation like this, but maybe not, who knows. So I guess it's like a tiny betrayal of Nick's character, if only a little bit, but it's definitely not as bad as some of the stuff that's coming in a second here. And then this scene is interrupted by the Dalek shooting at them, so they all uh, dip into Nick's storage unit, where they see a bunch of stuff that he has, and we have a discussion about how Nick has a lot of ex-girlfriends, and the stuff that he's storing every New Year's Eve is their belongings. In terms of elements in this episode, I think this is, like, second worst thing in it, this whole idea that Nick, this awkward guy who can't seem to get his words out around girls, has, like, dozens upon dozens of ex-girlfriends, if only for, like, a few days. And it doesn't really get, like, explained as to how he's able to get so many girlfriends all the time. It just exists for, like, a joke, I guess. Like, all the characters go, man, you're weird, and the audience laughs or something, but it's such a betrayal of Nick's characterization throughout the entire episode. It's such, like, a logical leap. So yeah, all the characters bully Nick for having a lot of ex-girlfriends and being weird, so he literally goes and commits, commits suicide by Dalek. He opens the door and just sacrifices himself for his friends because he feels guilty which is a really weird moment that felt like it came out of nowhere. So Nick dies for no reason, and then the characters are all in shock from him dying, and then Sarah's mom calls. This is the third time, I believe. So it's just another instance of her saying the same lines again, and we hang up fairly quickly, and the characters at this point are trying to rationalize how on earth they're going to get out of this, to which uh, Sarah pitches the idea of maybe there being some supplies on the fifth floor, which is where Jeff's units were, that could maybe kill a Dalek. And then we go further in this dialogue scene where the Doctor finally explains the fact that with this time loop idea, we're counting down each minute to New Year's Day. So the time loop is getting shorter and shorter. They're having less and less time to plan and work to defeat the Daleks and get out of elf storage. I think it's a pretty cool concept to explore for like a New Year's countdown episode of this whole time loop thing. I don't think this episode particularly utilize the Groundhog Day concept well. The whole beauty of Groundhog Day is the fact that we are seeing Bill Murray's character change and grow throughout the movie. At the beginning, he was the guy that took his life for granted and wasted all his days, and then once he has the same day over and over, his perspective changes a lot throughout the movie, and through the course of this whole gimmicky time loop idea, he grows and becomes a better person. With Eve of the Daleks, we get nothing like that. So while it's a cool concept, and some of the characters did stand out in this episode, I think this time loop idea ultimately just became wasted to an extent. Like, there's no point in doing a time loop where we're getting the same dialogue over and over again if the, the episode doesn't, like, go anywhere with that idea. It's like, why have Sarah's mom call eight different times if you're never gonna really change it or push the characters to grow throughout the time loop. There is growth, 
by the end, and I'll talk about that later. It's my least favorite scene in this episode, and probably my least favorite Chibnall scene overall, so we'll get to it, but I think this episode just flubbed its characterization and character growth in something that Groundhog Day does very well. So the characters decide they want to go to the fifth floor to find some weapons that may or may not defeat a Dalek. The Dalek busts through Nick's storage unit door and then kills them after some dialogue about the time loop and his motives and whatever. He reveals that he, the Dalek is here, he, it is here because of the Doctor for some reason that we don't really know yet. So we're getting some more clues as to what the time loop is and why all this is happening. But yeah, all the characters die and then we start the fourth rotation. The characters at this point know exactly what's going on, so they all jump right into going to the fifth floor. We're with Sarah at the beginning, who obviously comes to after the time loop resets, and then the doll like teleports right behind her in the lobby, and she dodges its fire to get into the elevator to make her way to the fifth floor. And then we're with the Doctor and her companions in an elevator where Jodie Whittaker re-explains the fact that the time loop is shortening to work the plot more so Chris Chibnall can explain all of the facets of the time loop and leave nothing up to interpretation. Again, to reiterate from stuff like War of the Sontarans and my actual review of Flux in Chibnall, this stuff, the way Chibnall uses the Doctor as a mouthpiece to over-explain things, really betrays her character. And it is unfortunate that this is the way he uses the Doctor's character, but we are getting more of that here where the Doctor says, we're in a time loop and the time loop is shortening. Maybe if we get to midnight, the episode will resolve itself or something. So this is just Chibnall working the plot more in order to um, try to get a resolution out of this. And then out of nowhere, Dan decides he's going to split up with the Doctor and Yaz. At the moment when this happened, I was like, dude, Dan, you are so obviously making things 10 times worse for everyone. But he decides he's going to split up and leave the elevator. He gives almost no explanation for this. He just kind of says go on without me, or something to that effect, which obviously is not helpful at all, and at the moment I thought it was just Chibnall setting up something poorly, or trying to get Dan to a certain place on time, despite contradicting the energy of the scene and what the logical decision that Dan would make would be. I think later on this scene is fine, and I'll talk about it. it's one of my favorite scenes in the episode when we actually get to it, but as of right now, I really didn't like the way it was handled. Uh, we then see Sarah and Nick who bump into each other in the hallway and they talk about stuff and how crazy this is and Sarah decides that she wants to betray the doctor because she doesn't trust her which is a logical character progression for Sarah and I did enjoy that. It was a perfectly fine scene. And then we get without a doubt one of the best Chibnall scenes in his entire run and I'm sure John Bishop, this is like a career highlight for him given how much John Bishop just loves Doctor Who and I didn't talk about this before uh, but John Bishop on Instagram just is constantly shilling Doctor Who not because he is a part of this era and is trying to promote it but it seems to me that he really loves the show, he loves what it means, he's one of us, that's what I'm trying to say. Uh, and I really respect his passion for Doctor Who and what it means, and I relate to him a lot, even if I don't love the era of Doctor Who that he is in. So to have a scene where Dan confronts the Dalek and just kind of makes fun of it and, you know, pretends like it's an employee of Elf Storage, teasing it just to buy time for his friends until he literally sacrifices himself. Analysis concludes this is a delaying tactic. Took you long enough. Without a shred of hesitation, he just accepts his fate. It's moments like this that make me really love Dan. And it's sad that we didn't get this type of characterization, this selfless heroism, just like dedication to helping your friends no matter what, even at the cost of your own life, even if you are on a time loop. Uh, I think we should have seen this more and less of the typical, you know, formulaic companion doctor responses. It was a great scene, it was a great laugh, and it also had some emotional resonance to it and character development for Dan. I am always down for moments of characterization for Dan. So it was a great scene. I'll read my note here. Dan makes fun of the Daleks to buy them some time. Nice moment and surely a career highlight for John Bishop. Dan dies a hero. Then we're back with Sarah and Nick who are on the fifth floor at this point and uh, the Dalek comes up there around all of the uh, storage crates or whatever and the Dalek is appearing so both of them duck behind a box and have a nice discussion. Well, first before the discussion, Sarah's mom calls and we have the same dialogue again. It's nice, I guess, still, I maintain. It's kind of pointless to have this Groundhog Day thing, and you're not going to do anything with those phone calls. But yeah, we have a conversation between Nick and Sarah about, you know, forgiving each other, and they kind of get closer. It's at this point that Nick reveals he has romantic feelings for Sarah, which was obvious from the start. 
I don't think this romantic connection is one of this episode's strong suits. But I think with this, it's just like, these two characters don't remotely get along. So often throughout this episode, Sarah is like being polite to Nick because she needs to be polite because he's her only customer, but she despises him. She finds him really annoying and a nuisance and wishes she could get rid of him. Nick is obviously crushing on her at this point, but for Sarah, especially in the later scenes, to realize she has like this undying love for Nick, it just seems to me like we have a male character and a female character here. Why don't we put them together by the end, despite, you know, them not getting along at all? Like, it's okay if they became friends over the course of the episode, and I would have really liked to see that, but to go a step further and, you know, hook them up by the end feels too much. Uh, so I have a rather long note here. This was during the intermission between the ad break, so I just went on for a bit. Sarah and Nick have a conversation appreciating each other, and it's nice, I guess. I think Sarah is really quite good, and Nick isn't given that same attention, which kinda sucks. Nick is mainly just a vessel for jokes and a punching bag for Sarah, which is admittedly a fun enough dynamic. I just think that there's an intelligence for Sarah's dialogue that was not deployed for Nick, although he does have that depth to him. So far, Sarah is MVP. I think the characters are good mostly in this episode, especially comparatively for Flux. It's clear that Chibnall, with Flux, has learned how to make characters more intricate from handling characters like Jericho and Vinder and Carvanista. I have a huge feeling that the ending is gonna ruin this one. Same for something like the last two New Year's specials. So we cut back to the Doctor and Yaz, who are now on the fifth floor going through Jeff's stuff, uh, and they're going through all the stuff that Sarah at this point has already gone through, all of the, you know, canned goods and the bear statue and all of the explosive stuff. Uh, the Doctor quotes something that Sarah said at the beginning of the episode, despite never seeing her or knowing that she said that, which is really weird. I guess it's just an instance where, like, Chibnall was like, it would be pretty cool if, like, the Doctor quoted Sarah here, but she never heard her say it, so she's just somehow saying the exact same thing she said doesn't make any sense and it's in this scene that the doctor and companions kind of work together the solution for the episode seeing jeff's explosives or explosives his gunpowder stuff and fireworks uh, the doctor at this point is concocting the plan for the resolution so this is just a setup scene for that uh, but to end this scene the dalek appears and shoots around and somehow misses the doctor and yaz Oh, now we're back with Sarah and Nick. Okay, so we're back with Sarah and Nick, and this is the moment where Nick admits that he has a crush on her. I guess the other scene was just, like, the connection moment, and then here he's admitting that he's had a crush on her for three years, and that's why he stores his stuff every New Year's Eve, which obviously alarms Sarah and makes her fear for her life, but we have this scene where he admits that, and Sarah kind of tells him off a bit and calls him a stalker, and then the Dalek just kind of snipes Nick through the boxes or whatever, uh, which causes Sarah to run away, and then she goes for, like, a back freighter door, which is hard to open, so she tugs at the door, can't get it open, you know, begs for the door to be opened, it does not open, and then the Dalek kills her, so uh, they're both dead. And then we're back with the Doctor and Yaz, who, at this point, have come out of Jeff's stuff. They're back in the hallway, running back, and then the Dalek encounters them, and then we get another one from behind. So there are two Daleks here now, which is nice to see. The Doctor and Yaz are obviously about to die, so she asks some more questions about what the hell is going on, to which the Daleks admit that they are here because of the TARDIS. So with this whole... Uh, resetting and purging the Flux stuff from the TARDIS. It has created this time loop thing, and they are here because of that, and they're also here because they want to get vengeance on the, do the Doctor for killing their race at the end of Episode 6, The Vanquishers, which was actually the meddlings of the Sontarans. That was their whole trick against them, if we remember back in Episode 6. So we're getting more of that here, at which point I went, oh yeah, they were in Episode 6 because they, were, they literally like teleported in for like 10 seconds of screen time before they got obliterated in a big CG shot where the Flux eats the Dalek spaceships. Jodie Whittaker references her favorite Doctor Who episode. That was a Sontaran stratagem. And then she dies. So we're on the fifth rotation now, five out of nine. We have four to go. And this is the last four that are gonna set up the resolution and resolve the episode. Uh, at the beginning of the fifth rotation, all of our characters meet up fairly quickly, except for Nick. And then Sarah has a big moment where she wants to go save Nick because apparently she likes Nick, which feels really fabricated and I have a note on it. Sarah apparently likes Nick and it's coming out now, where she goes after him despite having been with dozens upon dozens of girls. 
feels like a great way to get your heart broken or stabbed. I think this romance between Sarah and Nick is both a contradiction of Nick's character like twice over in this episode, both the fact that he is this awkward guy and that he has a bunch of exes, as well as being a contradiction of Sarah's intelligence as well. She's characterized as a smart young woman. She's able to run her own business. She is very capable in social situations. She's more than happy to let someone know that they are getting on her nerves. And the fact that she, someone who has a strong you know, urge to stay her hand from getting into relationships as we've established throughout the episode, all of a sudden is head over heels for Nick, someone who has been with dozens upon dozens of girls. I think if I was Sarah, I would at least consider a little bit how long that relationship would last with someone who's been with dozens upon dozens of girls. If you've been with that many girls, there's only one dependent variable, and it's you. You are the problem. So Sarah going with Nick to be with him despite being a very intelligent person, I think is very silly. And I don't like this dynamic at all, as I've already said. But it's a contradiction of, you know, the logic of the story, the logic of, you know, using a concept like Groundhog Day to make characters grow and change and interact, as well as contradicting what we've established about Sarah and Nick. I think it's just like, it's so wrong. The Doctor convinces Sarah to stay here and she goes off to go save Nick, to which we then cut away to see Nick He's being antagonized by some two Daleks down the hallway where he died before. Uh, they're coming at him, they're coming at him, they're gonna kill him. He's looking back and forth, and of course he fucking ducks, and both of the Daleks gun each other down, killing each other. He can't get out, that lock's got a billion combinations. The Daleks are genius. It can calculate a thousand billion combinations in one second flat. So we've made it. My least favorite thing in this episode, and probably my least favorite moment in Chris Chibnall's series overall. It is very much indicative of the way he has written his era of Doctor Who, and the way he has handled character development, plot management, subtlety, show-don't-tell concepts, all of that stuff. So the Doctor fetches Nick, and then they go back to the lobby. We have all the characters together here, and we have a big group brainstorming session about how to maybe defeat the Daleks and get out. We have some plot stuff being established about the fact that maybe the characters are going to blow up the building. Jodie Whittaker asks Sarah if she would be okay with the building being blown up. Jodie continues to establish more stuff involving the resolution. And then we get a big speech from Jodie Whittaker. Oh, I'm sorry, Chris Chibnall, where he basically spells out the theme of the episode. The fact that we need to learn from the failures and that through the course of the Groundhog Day loops, we're going to be bonding together and we're going to get a big old friendship. We got to work together, a big teamwork moment. It's this whole profound speech. It does not work because this has not been explored at all throughout the episode. There have been almost zero moments where characters are learning from the failure and bonding through the failure. We've had moments where characters connect, but it was completely divorced from the fact that we are reliving the same moments. It is a character's journey, a very artificial journey, especially in the case of Sarah and Nick, happening in an episode that just so happens to feature a time loop. So in an episode that wasn't really doing a lot of respect to its potential themes and the ways that you explore a time loop story and characterization and character growth through story in general, it's really, really awful that Chris Chibnall is deciding to write a line where he explicitly spells out what the theme, the theme of the episode is, or at least what he hoped it would be. Having the Doctor say, we can do this, you know, we'll work through the failure, that's how we do it, you know, failure makes us stronger, and we're gonna bond together, we're gonna work together as a team, and develop a friendship, is a message in the exact same way that the master saying everything that you know is about to change is a mystery. It is not. There is no mystery in saying that there is, in fact, a mystery. There is no message in saying that there is, in fact, a message. You have to depict the episode through the characters, through the story, through the setting, and the progression of events, and the conflict of the episode. And this episode did not do that. It did this. And it's this big grand moment where the Doctor, you know, turns toward the Daleks as they appear. You know, she steps out. It's a big epic moment where the Doctor has finally, you know, she's finally spelled out the theme of the episode. Oh my god, I'm so, like, motivated. No! <laughs> 
And it's like even worse when I see on YouTube the next day, you know, the Doctor YouTube channel posting the Doctor's time loop speech or whatever the fuck. Because it's not a speech. There's like n nothing is learned from explicitly saying things about mysteries. What is so good about like the 12th Doctor's anti-war speech is it's rooted in the story. Eve of the Daleks is not a story about failure and learning to cope with failure and, you know, bonding over and through failure, whereas the Zygon Invasion Inversion is an episode specifically about war. So the speech in the Zygon Inversion advances the plot, it wraps up the plot, and it also is thematic, larger than the episode. Whereas this one is just, like, a motivational Instagram post, and it's ridiculous. I say that it's my least favorite Chris Chibnall thing ever because it's like one of very few moments in Chris Chibnall's run that made me just want to shrivel up into a ball and cry endlessly. So we get that. We get that nice big speech. I hated it beyond words. I My jaw literally dropped when I first saw it, and then I proceeded to bury my face in my hands for several seconds on end, and then the three Daleks kill all the characters and we enter the sixth rotation. And this sixth rotation pretty much only exists to set up Phasmin. Yes, if you haven't watched this episode, Phasmin is in the episode. I will get into it later. But in the larger implications of the sixth rotation, it's important to note that right after the characters died at the end of the fifth rotation, Sarah and Nick are killed immediately, just so that we can have a moment where Phasmin happens. Oh god, okay, so... Man, this shit makes me really emotional. Uh... So there's, it's really complex, all right, I gotta, I gotta say that. So the Doctor and Dan and Yaz appear at the beginning of the sixth rotation, and Yaz and the Doctor get into a little minor argument about her splitting off, but she goes off, the Doctor wanders off, and uh, Yaz and Dan have a connection about Thasmin, or, you know, Yaz's feelings for the Doctor. I hate using those ship terms. That's just the way I've recognized it because of all of the people on Instagram that have been begging for it since the beginning of Flux. Here's the thing, like, I've been vocal about how I feel about Doctor Companion romance, and I, you know, I've been open about the fact that it doesn't matter, first of all, I need to say immediately, it does not matter that it's a lesbian relationship, it does not factor in any way to me, like, it would be the same if Dan suddenly confessed his feelings to the Doctor, I would still equally hate it. And it was set up, even if very minimally, uh, throughout Flux, but I think, it's just a moment of, like, it's been addressed, but there's no, there's no, it's, like, not focused on. It feels as though Chris Chibnall has kind of left this door open, like, this whole, like, oh, maybe that, maybe Yaz likes the Doctor throughout Flux, and then, like, literally third from his last episode, he's deciding he's gonna explore this, even though I think it's an element in specific to the Doctor-Companion dynamic that is a detriment to the character of the Doctor and the character of the Companions. I have to say that I'm grateful that some depth is being implemented into Yaz, it's just unfortunate that it is happening now of all times. You know, third from last episode in one scene, out of, no out of nowhere to a degree. Like, it has been set up, but it hasn't been, like, thoroughly set up. It's been alluded to, not an escalation of, like, setup that Yaz's feelings for the Doctor are emerging the way it was for something like Martha. I will say the acting is fantastic. I love the way the camera is positioned with Yaz, Yaz on her side profile like this, and then Dan over here, out of focus, and the camera pans in, and he looks f fucking heartbroken at the way Yaz is feeling. I love that expression, and I have to say, throughout you know, her entire run of being on Doctor Who, the way Mantip Gill can cry is fantastic. She has some of the best tears in Doctor Who I've ever seen, and her acting here is fantastic. She appears very hopeless in her feelings. I just don't like the fact that it's an avenue in terms of a Doctor companion dynamic that Chibnall is saying, okay, this is something that I do want to explore, and it's going to be linked to the final episodes, and I especially don't like that it hasn't been directly escalated and explored on top of the way that I've always felt about Doctor Companion romance. I'm not a fan of it. <laughs> the way Dan says, you haven't told her, have you? When I watched it for the first time, I was, I was typing on my laptop taking notes. I heard that, and I looked up, and I was like... So I don't outright hate it. I just think 
it isn't set up enough, much like everything in Chibnall. I'm appreciating that Yaz is being given more depth, even if it's depth that I don't think you should implement into a Doctor Companion dynamic. So yeah, when I said the sixth rotation only exists to set up Phasmin, I mean that. Literally, right after this gets revealed, all the characters die again. So at the start of the seventh rotation, things are speeding up now because the episode has ran out of ideas, so we're just zooming right into the uh, finale. So all of these rotations are having less and less stuff in them. Uh, at the beginning of the seventh rotation, the Doctor discovers some fireworks in boxes, and at this point she's still concocting the resolution, uh, and then Yaz walks off in a big fit of rage. They have a little argument about how the Doctor needs to defend her, and she doesn't want him to die because of decisions she's made, or whatever, I guess, in relation to the Flux, even though it literally wasn't her fault. And then Dan brings up Phasmin to the Doctor, to which I have to give credit to Chibnall. The Doctor does not reciprocate the feelings. She I mean, doesn't even understand what Dan is saying at the beginning when he says, she likes you, by the way. She just goes, I don't know what you're saying, Dan. Love that line delivery. Uh, and then going forward from that, Dan says, you know, I think you do, and I think you're just pretending that you don't. And then he walks off, and then the Doctor has a real, you know, sad stare off into the middle distance. I don't know what the implications of that long stare into the middle distance are. I hope they aren't romantic feelings that she's suppressed, because I would have problems with it, as I have with, you know, the Rose stuff. So yeah, this seventh rotation is just to set up the resolution. It's at this point that Sarah and Nick are transporting the explosives to where the fireworks are, so at this point we're just kind of setting up this big explosive explosion. You've probably already guessed that this is how the episode is going to resolve itself. It's a big explosion because Jeff just so happens to have explosives in his unit because he's such a weird guy. Uh, and that's pretty much what the seventh rotation is. It's to set up the final rotation because of the way the Daleks are adapting to what the uh, characters are doing and the way that with each rotation the Daleks have gotten wise to them time and time again. So the Doctor proposes a decoy plan for the 8th rotation to uh, fool the Daleks so they don't anticipate their explosion plan in the final ninth rotation. So yeah, all the characters at this point have set up the explosion, they're discussing the decoy plan, they're all on the same page on what is going to happen on the ninth rotation, and then the Daleks come in, kill everyone. So we're on the 8th rotation now, this is the decoy rotation, it is probably like 30 seconds of a rotation where everyone just dicks around and then dies just to throw the Daleks off on the wrong foot. I don't fully get the logic behind that, but whatever. And we're finally here, the ninth rotation, the final rotation of Eve of the Daleks. We finally made it, the resolution. So, at the beginning of the ninth rotation, Sarah calls her mom in order to set up the plan. You know the whole phone me 10 seconds before midnight that the Doctor wants her to do, so she does that. The Doctor and company are transporting more explosives down to the big explosive pit with all the, you know, fireworks and whatever, and the Daleks come behind. They somehow miss... Like, I'm not a stickler for, like, Stormtrooper aim or whatever, because whatever, gotta make a tense somehow, but it's literally, like, a straight hallway, and the Dalek somehow misses. It's kind of ridiculous, and he shoots so much, too, and it's such a long, straight hallway. It would be almost impossible to miss. And then we're back at the explosion, we see the Doctor rigging the explosives, rigging all the fuses, hooking up uh, Sarah's phone into the explosive mix, and then they eventually all flee out the back door, the big freighter door that Sarah discovered earlier. So they all dip out there, they trick the Daleks into uh, shooting at Sarah's phone because they think Sarah's mom is a person, so they're like human detected, and then they shoot the explosives to trigger them, and then it explodes kind of ridiculous the fact that Daleks are these advanced you know tanks they have heat vision and human detecting technology and stuff but they think that this fucking cell phone with FaceTime is a person kind of ridiculous but whatever but yeah all the characters flee out the back and we get a big you know New Year's Day fireworks show of all the explosions going off the building exploding and then we get a nice fireworks show on New Year's Day uh, we see the guy from the woman who fell to earth in a short cameo where he's filming the fireworks. It's the, it's the guy from uh, Zem Shah's, you know, challenge or whatever. If it feels like I kind of zoomed through the resolution there, that's because it's exactly how it felt in the actual episode. Like, after the fifth rotation, we're just like, boop, 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 setting up the... Because, it like, the episode has run out of ideas at this point. And then we have some short ending scenes of the Doctor getting into the repaired TARDIS. You know, Dan and Yas sailing off for more adventures. It's just a little scene where they enter the TARDIS. The Doctor flips the lever, and then we also get a scene of Nick and Sarah being together for some reason and going traveling. They're at the airport, they're getting out of their car, 
And they're a couple, because of course they are. <laughs> so yeah, that was Eve of the Daleks. Fun fact, I have talked like hours upon hours about this episode. It's probably like four and a half cumulative hours of me talking that I've edited down into these episodes. I've recorded this over the course of three days just because, you know, it's winter break and I, I, I live with my family, so I have a bunch of people moving around throughout the course of the day. And it took me so long to get this one out, so I apologize for the long wait. I would rather it be late than come up like a bad review. In terms of the episode, I think I may have been a bit too harsh to like the dialogue of the episode, and I will confess to thinking that this one was a little bit more filler than I was hoping for something like the Jodie Whittaker specials. I was expecting like, I mean, we think about the first episode of the David Tennant specials, Planet of the Dead, almost no relevance to the back half of the David Tennant special. So maybe I'm being a bit too harsh to judge this one in terms of its relevance to both Flux and the rest of the story in the Jodie Whittaker specials leading up to the 13th Doctor's regeneration. I can see how people like this one, and I do like this one to a Chibnall caliber. I don't think it's the best Chibnall episode ever, but it is definitely like third best. I don't think that's even really disputable. You know, we have Villa Diodati, Village of the Angels, and then this one. I think it just had, like, the least painfully botched characterization. I think Sarah was actually quite good. Dan had some fantastic moments. The Doctor had some nice moments, some nice jokes. Nick had some nice moments, I guess. But I think there's still a lot of stuff that isn't very good in this one. And I still don't really think that this episode is, like, good in opposed to, like, the rest of Doctor Who. There's a ton of bad stuff in this episode, you know? Uh, stuff like this Jeff character that we never see, who has resolved the episode by simply having explosives in his unit, the Nick and Sarah hooking up thing, which is awful, uh, Thasmin, which I remain a bit mixed on just because I don't really know where it's going, and a complete butchering of the concept of doing a time loop Groundhog Day story and playing to that concept's strengths. It feels very much as though this is a Chibnall episode kind of wrapped in this whole time loop thing without being rooted into it, which is what good stories do. They are rooted into their concepts and their gimmicks, which is why Groundhog Day is such a beloved film. Eve of the Daleks is a butchering of that, I feel, which sucks because it could have been great. But yeah, still the third best Chibnall episode, just because it has some good characters, funny moments, cool setting, whatever, even if I don't think the episode really played to its strengths. So yeah, that was my review of Eve of the Daleks. I hope you've enjoyed. I'll be back with the next Jodie Whittaker specials episode in Easter, which is a long time away. So I guess I'll just be in stasis until that date. I'm working on a new video essay right now. I don't really want to reveal too much about it just because I think hype is kind of silly and I don't want to build expectations of a new video essay. I just want to kind of work on it silently. And when it's ready, you'll get it. But I do want it to be... I want to do the... Uh, hours upon hours of reviews. I think those work really well with both the YouTube algorithm and the kind of content that I want to make. I think those are really fun videos and it allows me to focus really hard on like one script, make one really good video so that people can enjoy it for years to come. So yeah, I hope you've enjoyed. I hope this uh, review was worthy of my, you know, typical Doctor Who review treatment. There's a lot of stress, typically because this is like the last Doctor Who episode I'm going to be able to talk about for a long time until Easter, so I wanted to really savor that, but it's also a lot of stress to make a follow-up video to, you know, the remastered video essay, a video that I've spent so long on making. So I had to give that kind of treatment to this one just because there's a lot of expectations surrounding it. I hope, I hope it lived up to it. I put a lot of time into saying things that I felt I felt, and uh, I hope you agreed, or disagreed, or, you know, found me fair, or whatever. Anyway, bye.